Hey y'all, welcome to Detoxicity, a show about progressive masculinity. I'm the show's host and producer, Mike Joseph. If you enjoy what you're hearing on the show, I kindly ask that you smash the subscribe button on whichever platform you're using to listen. Also, please don't hesitate to rate, comment, and recommend. If you have someone in your life that could get something out of the conversations we're having here, tell them about the show. Also, feel free to follow me on social media. I'm Detox Pod Guy on Instagram and Tis Mike Joseph. That is T I S Mike Joseph on Twitter. You can even email me, detoxpod at gmail.com. Don't hesitate to reach out if you know someone who might be interested in being interviewed on the show or if you have any other ideas or constructive criticism. Most importantly, I thank you very much for listening. Stay well. Brian Rosenworcel, also known as the Thunder God, is the drummer for rock band Guster. Over the course of Guster's 30 years as an active unit, Brian has gained notoriety for not only his musicianship, but his humorous and often quirky online presence as expressed on the band's road and studio journals as well as their socials. Uh, This was actually our second stab at recording. Our first attempt got thwarted by noise, uh, noise inside my apartment, and eventually noise outside my apartment because we recorded it on a traffic median. Anyway, uh, Brian was gracious enough to say let's do that again, and we got into a quieter environment and talked a second time. Uh, the good thing is that Brian is such a great conversationalist that it didn't matter that we were performing a do-over on an already recorded podcast. Brian has a lot to share regarding parenting, politics, what it takes to keep a relationship going three decades in, his band's fan base, and the qualities he'd like to approve about himself, improve about himself, and so much more. Uh, this was a fun and thoughtful conversation. I hope that you all enjoy. Brian Rosenworcel, ladies and gentlemen, and others. My name is Brian Rosenworcel. I live in Brooklyn, New York. I play drums in a band called Guster, and it is an honor to be on Mike's podcast. Is it really? Thank you. Thank you for doing this a second time. So we did this once before. There was construction here at the apartment, so we went onto the median of a highway and used an iPhone and had a great chat, and then I said, hey, why don't we do this with good audio? <laughs> <laughs> and now we're doing it with no construction and no traffic median, which is great. I was on a podcast once before where the uh, recording device didn't work, so we used some backup device, and it just didn't sound good. And nobody listened to that podcast, but it was a podcast where people told their poop stories. Uh, you have a lot of poop stories. I, yeah. I, as a, someone who has read the Guster Road Journal many times over the years, you seem to find yourself in some very unfortunate situations. Yeah, and so that podcast seemed tailor-made for me, and I told one of my, my humdingers, <laughs> told one of my best stories and and yet it just sounded so distant that it didn't get the didn't get the listens that some of the other stories on that podcast got and so i want to make sure we nail this one we're gonna nail it are you gonna retell the story before we officially not on this it? podcast ah, it's inappropriate damn it, damn it. okay um, and can you tell it to me after we're done recording it, yeah it's a it's a porta potty story okay is it in the road journal oh god and it probably is okay cause... And I've probably heard it already. Yeah. <laughs> or at least read it already. So, you're about to do a huge show, which will have happened by the time uh, this podcast episode is live at Red Rocks. Biggest show you've ever done. You have been in this band now for 30 years, almost? Yeah. Yeah. Do you still get nervous? Yeah. I mean, especially, it's like, we weren't sure what would come after the pandemic. Would we... Would we want to play? Would people want to come see us? You know, start off by playing a small gazebo in Western Massachusetts. Or, but we decided to come back with Red Rocks, which is a famous venue we, we never thought we'd be able to headline. And, and people wanted to see us when we sold it out and there was an orchestra playing with us. So it feels like, yeah, there's some pressure and it feels like I have relevance again after a year and a half of just, you know, making pancakes for my kids <laughs> but that's so relevant being able to spend time with your kids and your family and, and your dog it's true it is relevant and one thing i've learned is it's not enough um, for you for me or for them <laughs> <laughs> well i mean we'd have to discuss that with them in a separate interview but what is it is it the performance part of it? Is it the drummer part of it that sort of maybe completes you more? What are all the hyphens? I mean, I don't know a lot of people, moms or dads, that are satisfied being at home with the kids. 
just on a personal level. And you know, this was an experiment where we stopped time, we had an unexpected hiatus from the band, and you know, it, it showed me just how grateful I am for the family, but just how much we all need to be out of each other's space so we can feel sane. Has that always been your M.O., or have you always been like an I need my space kind of guy? I've always had like this amazing balance. When you go on tour a few months a year, you get a balance. You get to have your life where you see friends and you're on stages and you feel the rewards of your art. And then you have your moments where you're home and available and present. And I've always found that to be a really good balance. Some people will work nine to five and have their evenings with their family. But for us, <clears throat> it's been in like weeks at a time being gone and weeks at a time being. I've, one thing I learned is that balance does suit me. And so I'm glad it's returning. Good. Good. So you, I'm trying to remember now, were born in Connecticut? Well, I was born in Illinois. Grew Illinois. Up, grew up in suburban Connecticut. Connecticut. I've had several people that I've interviewed before who have come from suburban Connecticut. I know next to nothing about suburban Connecticut because I've not spent very much time in suburban Connecticut or suburban anywhere for that matter. But let me ask you, what do you think my suburban Connecticut upbringing was like? Imagine it. I imagine it being very white. <laughs> it was white. All right. Ding. <laughs> I, I, I just, whenever I think of somebody who grew up in the suburbs, I always think sitcoms, right? I think Growing Pains or, or not Leave it to Beaver, but, you know, like the 80s, the Wonder Years, you know, 80s sitcoms. And two parents and the dog and the big sibling and the little sibling and the nice house and the, that, that kind of thing. So it's very family ties in my head. Yeah. That is correct. Okay. Uh, and, you know, having spent now 22 years in Brooklyn, I see that it wasn't reality. I see that my upbringing, while it had its benefits, and I could ride my bike with a fishing rod and play street hockey and feel all the luxuries of that lifestyle, I didn't have a perspective. You know, they taught us back then about you know, Native Americans and imperialist colonialists uh, getting along and sharing corn recipes. Oh, of course, right, yes, that was the, the first Thanksgiving. And in where... the context of what is now a discussion about what is called critical, critical race, race theory, theory, I'm realizing what is being proposed in a lot of red states especially is a whitewashing, is a version of history where children don't learn the realities of why we're here and how we're here and why you're here. Right. And and that's frightening. It is absolutely frightening. It is I mean on one hand, thank goodness for the internet because I feel like people can do research and set themselves straight. But on the other hand, how much damage and I can even say cuz I was taught the same stuff even in New York City public schools you know, first Thanksgiving, the Indi the American settlers came and they got along with the Indians great and everybody shared their food and it was a love fest and all that stuff. How damaging is it to be taught that stuff and accept it as truth at a young age and then get to a point, whether it's in your teenage years or your 20s or 30s or whatever, where you're confronted with a completely different reality that makes more sense as the truth. Like, what does that do to your head? So I remember moments in my life where I had to challenge myself. One, when I was 18 at Tufts, and the Rodney King riots were happening in L.A. And I remember being in a pretty much all-white wing. Of, it was a male wing of our dorm. For a liberal school, my neighbors were pretty conservative. They were focusing in on this one... Uh, video highlight of uh, a man being dragged out of his truck Reginald. and that was sad and, yeah. it, and it stirred up emotions but that was their focus and I remember feeling like I had graduated to a place of more clarity where I wanted to keep the focus on why was Rodney King treated like that by the police and why is there so much anger Let's focus on that. Let's keep our eyes on the prize here. And I was the only voice there. And so at eight, despite my suburban upbringing, I feel like I was ready 
I was ready to not just live in a comfort zone, and you know, and I, I didn't like the people in my way. <laughs> what was that moment? Is there a particular time that you can point to where you were like, "Oh, this stuff isn't the stuff that I've been fed," or was there like, was there an epiphany, or how did you, particularly at that in 1992 or whatever it was, before Twitter and and wokeness and all that other stuff? I think I just, I wanted to believe that we, white and black would all get along. I kind of came from a place where that was how it w w was supposed to be. There weren't a lot of realities. And then you see all this outrage coming out. You see all this destruction. And you can't just call it destruction. You just can't say people who loot are morally depraved. You can't just focus on the Reginald Denny situation. You have to like ask deeper questions, you know, and, and also I was starting to uh, liberal arts school where you're learning about institutional stuff. And, right. You know, I, I began to go down a path which, you know, led me to wanting to be in this city and also led me to a path where I'm on Twitter just raging all day. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do. And I want to get to your Twitter raging in a second. It's really interesting that I'm, my brain is now kind of tracking back to 1992 and remembering news reports. And we talk a lot about news bias now. And the two things that are now playing on a loop in my head are, can't we all just get along? The press conference with Rodney King where he says that. And the fact that it seemed like all of these news reports really focused on these black kids pulling this white guy, Reginald Denny, out of his truck and beating the shit out of them. And that, that really is kind of... Now, looking at it in a 2021 light, where I'm more knowledgeable about news bias and that kind of stuff, it just it's clicking in my head now all of a sudden. This is what they want us to, to think. And if you don't have the power or the knowledge to think critically or independently, you and me to an extent as a 16-year-old are just going to be like, well, why are these black people, and, and I say this as a black person, burning up their neighborhoods and beating up random white people? It's a fair question. Yeah. You know, why is this happening? And, and maybe that question would have helped focus some people on uh, what's going on beneath the surface and beneath the highlights. But in 2021, what I recognize is my seven-year-old boys know all about George Floyd. And their questions are, why would that officer do that? Or, or is he bad? Right. Why does he hate black people? And it's a lot for a seven-year-old, but it's necessary. And they know that the settlers of this land were cruel. And that's an important thing to know. It, it's okay to live here and acknowledge the realities. I mean, are, in these states where they're probably not teaching much about George Floyd, and where critical race theory is going to be uh, this boogeyman that is uh, abolished, are they going to not teach about slavery? Right. Are they actually going to take that many steps backwards? I think in the writing of, of the laws that are being uh, composed in these states, I believe that's true. They're not going to teach to, about yeah. slavery? Yeah. 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 What I feel like is going to happen, because you can't do this in a vacuum, right? Like, there's going to be all of these other voices beyond whatever curriculum is being taught. And it's just going to maybe confuse some people, maybe get some people to sort of reject the education system altogether. It's going to be weird to see what happens in the next few years. It does feel like we're... Uh hardening into our civil war rift yeah. again, which was completely unexpected. I know you and I both felt a, a fantastical sense of progress during the Obama years. Yep. And we had a harsh last four years to realize that under the surface there's just so much hate still. And you mentioned raging on Twitter, which I don't think you do. I think you're very pointed with some of the things that you say, which I think people have to be. But I don't, and we've had discussion a couple of times in the past, I don't consider you, you don't seem like a very angry person. I think a lot of uh, Guster fans who, oh, found me on Twitter, oh, I'll follow Brian. He's, he writes the Funny Road Journals, 
and then they see that a lot of my posts are about, I don't know, the NRA being, having blood on their hands, or whatever it is, it might be like, oh, this is this is not what I expected. Do they think you're just going to, like, talk about doo-doo all the time? I mean, I like to talk about doo-doo, but somehow t Twitter is a place with a political bent, and that's where those topics feel like they're being absorbed and, and, and feel... I, I feel like, God, it's, it's a terrible place to feel like I'm contributing because it's really a cesspool. Um, oh, boy. But it is, yes, it, it is. It is a place where your voice is noticed. And I think you can find your space in that cesspool, have a voice by virtue. I mean, everybody has a voice, but you have an amplified voice by virtue of being who you are. And people, look, people are more willing to listen to you than they're going to be willing to listen to me. Well, I mean, wait till this podcast drops. <laughs> You're too kind, Brian. Again, that pointedness isn't something that I really consider anger. Maybe some people who have a different perspective on what anger is might see it as anger, but I just see it as you speaking your truth, like you're speaking your mind. You're being direct, but not being... There's not, I, don't, I don't see rage. Yeah, okay. I mean, I've been actively working on subduing my angry side. So, you know, it often comes out only in the context of family dynamics or sometimes when the band is in the studio. But as you get older, you're either going to harden into your anger and rage and end up, you know, clutching your guns, or you're going to, like, look inside and grow and soften and be grateful. And I think I'm on that vector. I think it was close for a while, <laughs> really? especially in the last year. And this may be uh, a little toxic on my part, but I used to be a wall puncher and a computer thrower. That was kind of how I manifested my anger. Was that how you... Hang on, let's stay here. How did you overcome that? You know what, Brian? I don't know. I think I just got to a point where I was like, well, this is useless. I'm hurting myself. I'm breaking things that I have to pay to replace. Like, this isn't doing me any good. It's just putting me in a worse situation than I was in before. So it wasn't an event or a moment. It was just over time. You... Gradual. And it's only really been in the last, I'd say, like two or three years that I, I have not punched a wall. We are men in our 40s. Yeah. And, and I think our message here is that a lot of men don't begin this process until they're, for you it happened naturally, for me it was a lot of therapy. But even the therapy didn't help as much as maybe pushing my situation domestically to the break and having to like, be like, okay, I need to, I need to really nip this. Uh, and that's what it was for me during the pandemic when, you know, obviously everyone's a little bit off. Oh yeah. When we tr I transitioned from being on the road to being a homeschool teacher. Which, <laughs> that's I, a fucking switch. I thought I could do it, but, you know, my kids were also transitioning and, and full of anxiety, and there we are, isolated together. It wasn't pretty. I needed my own time and space, and I think, I think there just came a moment where it was like, why am I holding on to this? Why am I choosing to do this? Why am I choosing to be bitter or resentful about this or that? And you realize it's a choice. And then one day you just choose not to do it. It's a choice that doesn't benefit you. You or anyone else. Right. I just, you know, one conscious thought that I have is when I'm, whether it's 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 20 days from now, when I'm on my deathbed, I don't want to be consumed by anger or regret. That's great. And we have a conscious choice in that. It's true. And a lot of people don't realize that. They might think that they're a victim of this or that. It's a process, but you have the ability to let it go and to shift gears. Indeed. And, and, and for me, tied in with that process was kind of removing my identity from the band a bit. And it was too tied up. I cared too much about it little details and ticket sales and success and then I just came to a point where I was like you know I have to look back at 30 years as this awesome unexpected career and just be grateful for it 
the odds of that happening are so ra- so small and it's so random i feel like you do have to kind of take a step back and look at the whole of this experience that's happening and be like holy shit i'm kind of a lucky duck uh, in, in in some sense yeah i mean especially i mean i showed up at college with a pair of bongos and i barely knew how to play them so when you're 18 and you just fall into a band where the the songwriting carries you while you learn your instrument. That is lucky. I know I eventually had a lot to do with the band's success, and I recognize that, but I definitely stumbled into uh, a career and just feel fortunate for you know, all the people I've met, all the experiences I've had, all the music we put into the world that I know has made a difference for people. Right. What does it feel like to essentially have been in a, <laughs> in a relationship with the same two guys for 30 years? I mean, it's deep, and it, it's complex, and it informs my own marriage. You know, it, it's it's healthy, it's not amazing, but right now it's functional. And, and one thing I have learned is that the music you make and is often tied into the relationships. If you're going to get in a room with each other, and there's a power dynamic, or you're feeling shy about something, or just somehow not free, you're going to be a little tighter, you're going to be a little bit more careful, you might be a little more critical, whatever it is. You need those relationships and the communication to be solid. If everyone's free and everyone's saying yes to each other, you're going to expand what it is you can do. And I felt like we've done a good job with that in the last couple of Because you've definitely expanded sonically. You look at like the first couple of Guster albums, and the last couple of Guster albums in there. There's a through line, but they're a lot more electronic now. You know, there is a whole overexcited, where Ryan's like singing, with, or talking in like, with like a British act. There's all this kind of interesting, weird stuff where it's not just you on bongos and acoustic guitars and, and very folky sort of, of, of singing. So you guys have obviously sort of grown with each other, or at least accepted the different ways in which you've grown over the years and I do feel like any long-term relationship whether it's a friendship or a business partnership or a traditional marriage takes a lot of work and maybe sort of putting ego aside in a lot of cases specific particularly for a group of men yeah I mean wouldn't it be nice if if it didn't take work (laughs) I mean something my my wife actually actively enjoys the work okay you know there are people who like that for me it's not something I look forward to but I recognize it as necessary and everyone in our band is you know kind of aware that the dynamics between us have to be solid you know there have been tours where Ryan and I have been on opposite ends of the tour bus you know he was the front lounge I was the back lounge because there was some just unspoken conflict between us And, and I look back at that and think we didn't have the tools to confront it in that moment and do you see that differently now as middle aged gentlemen I think I do you know there's there's still plenty of stuff that comes up uh, that needs to be addressed I think more than ever after this pandemic we're going to be grateful for that tour bus when it rolls up (laughs) this winter when we hopefully go on tour I think we'll appreciate it more than ever but I don't know. know there might be someone reacted to the pandemic and feels more attached to their domestic situation and, and wants less tour bus. And right. we'll respect that. Right. And you know, we've always just kind of figured it out, figured out the schedules and everyone's situations and found the common ground. Switching gears a little bit, what brought you to Brooklyn? And I know you have roots, or your family has roots here. Was it uh, like a family thing, or was it just like, I want to live in New York City, or... What, what called you? Yeah, I do have roots here. My, my mom grew up in Crown Heights. My dad grew up in Williamsburg. And all four of my grandparents were in Sheepshead Bay. So we would travel to Brooklyn. And it was another universe. I remember sleeping in Sheepshead Bay on a pull-out couch at my grandparents. And coming from, you know, West Hartford, Connecticut, where you just heard, like, birds chirping it, and cicadas and crickets and stuff. I remember at night, <laughs> with the window open hearing just screaming 
sirens and screaming <laughs> and uh, like gaggles of of kids or whatever it was just like yelling all, all the wee hours of the night and as a kid I was like what is that right what is happening like I was afraid to even look out the window and none of my parents ever like sat me down and said like you know it's louder here I grew up in this place where it's different than right. I was just left to be like whatever was happening don't speak of it <laughs> so I feared Brooklyn on some level and yet I was intrigued by it obviously on others but there came a moment where after eight years in Boston and I know you've done your time in Boston I did eight years okay <laughs> where its limitations present itself and then uh, New York is there as a place with more people different people and I want to say better people I, I don't want Do we want to get Bostonians butthurt? I, Do we? I only mean that in the sense that, like, New Yorkers have a reputation for being, you know, hard or, or whatever, but I, I find the hearts to be much softer and much more easy to access. I agree with you. I agree with you. And not to shade Boston or anybody in Boston, I met some very nice people during my eight years in Boston, but... There's a provinciality in Boston that I don't think exists very much in New York. Maybe exists in some of the boroughs, but as a whole, I don't think really exists in New York. There is a... I say this as the oldest child in my family. It feels a little bit like little brother syndrome. Yeah. There's a syndrome. I yeah. mean, for me, there was a moment when I was 24 years old where I was... And visiting a friend in Brooklyn and he was showing me the neighborhoods and I was like, oh, like we were right at the point where we could stop living together in Somerville. You know, the band shared a, a four-bedroom apartment, shared one bathroom and one home phone for many years. Well, that must and have been fun. we come off the tour, park the van in the driveway <laughs> and all just, you know, wait Climb for each other to this. finish the bathroom stint so we could use it. It was too much. So there was a moment where I remember walking down Flatbush Avenue by myself at night, and I, I didn't feel fear. You know, and, and it almost feels like laughable, but I was pretty sheltered, you know? I, I West Hartford, Connecticut, sure. and Tufts in Boston. Sure. You know, I hadn't experienced anything quite so cosmopolitan. And walking down there, and everything about it felt like it was inviting me. And, I, and that was it. I, I got an apartment. And that was 22 years ago. Here I am. <laughs> That's an awesome story. And, and are you, do you think you're a lifer? I never thought I'd be a lifer. And yet it's hard to think about moving somewhere. You just dig roots. And you know, you got your people, you got your spot, your neighborhood. And so I may be a lifer. I mean, it's a lot of great places to be. I've traveled this country extensively. And I think at the time I'm on the West Coast, I'm like, well, I should I'm going to live out here at some point, right? No. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got three kids and a dog? Yeah. Yeah, packing them up and moving across the country sounds like an Herculean undertaking. What about you? Why do you stay here? I ask myself that question all the time. It's a lot of the things you mentioned. It feels like home for some inexplicable. You know, I've left twice, come back twice. This, I think, is where I'm meant to be right now. I... Not to sound like a soundbite, I love the fact that you can be any ethnicity, any color, any sexuality, any gender, any whatever, anything, and you are going to find your people in New York City. You're going to find your people in Brooklyn. It's not a small thing. I'm raising, I'm raising kids, and at least one is very fluid, and it feels very secure to know that his whole life... He is going to be recognized and accepted, and it feels like he won't have to be embarrassed to be his true self. And, and that's something that's available here and in other cities, but yeah, as, as this country figures itself out, there's lots of places where that's not available to Right, him. right. And there's something to be said about being in a place where... I mean, New York was a much different place when I was growing up. And there's still parts that are not as accepting. And growing up queer and knowing that I was queer and not 
having a place where that was validated. Once I got to a place where it was sort of validated, it probably took another 15 to 20 years before, after that, before I was able to sort of be comfortable in my own skin. Had, if, I mean, had I grown up in a somewhat different environment or had I been 10 or 15 years younger, I wouldn't have had to deal with any of that stuff. And I feel like the, the road to acceptance would have taken place way before it actually did. Yeah, I mean, we're really talking about two different Brooklyns here. Right. The Brooklyn that my kid is growing up in and the Brooklyn that you grew up in. Right. You know, which presumably was a black neighborhood where the culture was not going to accept your sexuality. Right. And so let's not confuse the fact that Brooklyn, everybody. Right. And, you know, it, it, some of it is time. But some of it is also sort of circumstance. I mean, I, you know, I was born in 1991 or 1996 instead of 1976 in the same place. Would my experience have been different? Maybe, but maybe not. Yeah. And your kids have the benefit of being white and in a different neighborhood and probably in a much better financial strata. So... Yes, it's not necessarily apples to apples. You ever, you ever watch that show on it called Dave? It's about a white rapper, Jewish rapper named Lil... Oh, Lil Dicky. Lil Dicky. I've heard of it, but I've not watched Season it. Season 2, Episode 3. Crazy episode. Uh, I don't want to give it away, but they get into these dynamics, especially black culture being a little bit less cool with, like, casual bromance stuff. Um... <clears throat> oh yeah. The way they present it is pretty poignant and I recommend it. That is really funny. I might have discussed this on a podcast before, but I feel like my white male friends, like my straight white male friends, always talk about like shit they did in college and like high school. I'm like, y'all did some gay ass shit. Like, how did y'all get away with that stuff? Like and you're heterosexual? Like I don't understand. I think there is like a underlying class thing and, and a racial thing beneath like having a certain amount of free mental time and right. whatever to not worry about this or that. Recommend the episode because it it, it nails this topic. I got to check that out. I, I This was maybe a week ago. I was looking at something on Instagram or whatever, and Little Dicky came up. And I was like, oh, I had no clue about this show. I only knew who Little Dicky was because I think he had a song with Chris Brown a few years ago. And I was like, this looks interesting. I mean, I don't even know him as, like, an actual musical artist. I only know him from this show where he's, like, a great actor in the script. Even his music is, it's kind of Weird Al-ish. It's, it's, so it's, it's right. comedy and not really, yeah. like, it's not Guster. <laughs> he has many more strings than Gus. Well, that's true. Too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I really, I really take the show. I gotta ask, as someone who is culturally aware and lives in this sort of uh, uh, melting pot of an environment, does it weird you out to play shows and have an audience that is so almost unilaterally white? I mean, you're one of the exceptions. Yeah, our I mean, music sounds to me very white, in that it was influenced by Brit pop and melodic artists, and you're not going to find like a lot of rhythmic Motown or any of uh, the elements of a lot of the black artists that I like to listen to hasn't made it into the music. You know, a lot of it has to do with my skill set as a drummer which is pretty influenced by Ringo or or, sure. or whatever it, it, it's just that we only have our skill sets but that said um, you don't choose your audience you know they choose you and the music is evolving which makes me happy I don't listen to the first two records and long to sound like that but I do feel like there is heft and depth to a lot of the songs we just recorded over the pandemic and I think it, to stay in a band this long you have to feel like you're on a on a solid vector towards making the music you want to make. What is it like to be a Black Guster fan? I, I'm a Black or uh, the only Black fan or a, not, I'm not everybody has Black fans there are a lot of 
artists in bands that I enjoy that do not have large black fan bases. You know, I've been to Dave Matthews band shows and there were more black people on stage than there were in the audience. I've been to Springsteen shows and there were more black people working at the venue than there were in the audience and in the band because there's Clarence and Jake Clemens and, and all that stuff. I like Chris Stapleton, who I would imagine probably has a fair amount of black fans because he's a very soulful singer, but there are... I love Toad the Wet Sprocket. There's a band that has... I don't think I've Maybe ever seen... Maybe whiter than Guster. Yeah. And, you know, I've spoken to Glenn Phillips a couple of times and, and been to a bunch of shows, and I don't think I've ever seen a black person at Toad the Wet Sprocket. I grew up in high school, and they were, like, my favorite band. Did you ever get into those first two records, Bread and Circus? Bread and Circus, Circus and Pale? Yeah. I don't like those as much. It's weird, because those are, like, my two favorites. Are they really? Yeah, but I hate when people say that about my band. So I I I don't I will cut it off here, but we gotta go to a Toad the Wet Sprocket show together, I mean, Brian. I haven't seen them in years. We played together in California once. Wow! And I'm friends on Facebook with the the bass player, and I I saw that we were friends, and I just one day, late at night, I wrote a whole chapter about my fandom. Oh God! Did so, you get a response? Yeah, he was like, "Cool." So you didn't freak him out, <laughs> okay? How does it feel? I've never gotten any static. I think sometimes when people look through my record collection, they're like, dude, what the fuck is this? But my family listened to, it was all black-derived music, whether it was, you know, R&B or disco or Latin music or reggae. But I was one of those nerdy kids that listened to American Top 40 every week. So whether it was Men at Work or Def Leppard or, or, or whoever, like, I ingested that stuff. And I, to me, it's like... Good music is good music. We're a couple years apart. Yes, yeah, so a couple we were, years. We were listening to the same radio. Probably. Probably. And I also, I have a thing for musicians. I think the people that I get along best with are musicians and comedians, generally. And the people that I'm attracted to also tend to be musicians or comedians. You mentioned comedians, and I'm a huge fan of both improv and stand-up comedy. And I've found that the comedians have a dark side. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've interviewed probably eight or nine comedians, stand-ups on there. I've got Chris Gethard that I interviewed. Yeah, I saw his one-man show. He's uh, he's fantastic. Which was, you know, getting into his suicidal side yep. and, like, you know, leaving it all out there. And, yeah, it does feel... To get up on stage and make people laugh, I think you got to have something going on there. It's different and than... Even to have the, have the depth of thought that arrives at the joke right. even, to create the material right. you have to be an extremely sensitive person or uh, you know, uh, a certain type of brain it's different than being a drummer I mean, as someone who is neither a comedian nor a musician I have no frame of reference yeah I mean I didn't expect to be a drummer I just kind of brought my bongos to college and Wait, what were you going to what was your career I was career? just going to put them on a shelf and I was going to be like I don't know journalist or I didn't know what I was going to be but you find one thing you're like oh wow this would be amazing if this worked out so you work really hard at it try to tell my kids that like just find one thing you love and do it over and over don't worry about your grades that's not I don't think that's necessarily bad what I just said yeah yeah I mean I don't know every parent's got to I feel like if you that will work out if you if you find, find something, something you that love. you don't get tired of doing. Right, right. That you want to do for forever, conceivably. So yeah. many people doing things and they're not sure if it's what they should be doing. And, or they're afraid to do the thing that they want to do or they're discouraged from it somehow and they end up doing something they hate and just kind of being like, fuck. Get one life. Yep, yep, absolutely. Here's a question. What's the biggest difference between the way that you are parenting your kids and the way that your parents parented you. And I don't know if you... You do have siblings. You have a sister. I have, a, I have an older sister. Yeah. That's a great question. I really feel like I'm doing a very different approach uh, than they did. I always felt loved. And before I say anything critical, if you have that, you're going to be fine. And so I always felt loved. But I also often felt controlled. And so I'm doing my best to create independent kids who feel like they have 
some freedom and some will to to do some things. That said, <clears throat> unlimited consumption of sugar and screens is really bad for them. <laughs> and that's the first thing that will emerge with that kind of approach. So, um, you know, rebalancing their inherent need for some structure with the feeling that they're free. That's a delicate balance. How do you do that without seeming like an overlord? You just have to do it lovingly, and I'm not always good at that, but if they can see that you're making the decisions in their best interest or from a place of love and not just blind control, uh, they'll, they'll come around to it, and no parent really knows if they're doing a good job. As they develop, you're like, oh, guys, we got to nip this on this one, and this one's doing this, and, and you feel really insecure all the time. But I try to remember, like, you know, they got two parents who love them crazy, and often that works out. So I'm not trying to distress about it too much. Again, you've got me sort of reflecting on my own upbringing. And when I was a kid, and even now, there was always the sense that your elders kind of had the last word on everything. I don't personally feel like I was really given much, and I think it's really important to respect kids for the fact that they are able to have a level of autonomy and they can make their own decisions. Obviously, they can't go out and get in the car and get a job and like do all that stuff, but they're not under a thumb all the time. Yeah, I, I think that's important. And like you said, it's delicate. It's, yeah, it's super delicate and balance. the flip side, you know. My daughter was so embarrassed by our dented minivan that I got a new minivan this month. What?! I didn't want to. How badly was it dented? It looks pretty embarrassing. She's a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> that said, it was the power steering that went. I was like, all right, I'm ready for a new one. Time for a new minivan. <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. Now, talking about just Brian Rosenworcel, what is the one thing, or what is one thing that you feel like you still need to do a lot of work on? A personal aspiration for yourself. I mean, I've been so focused on trying to be even keel, trying to, you know, not raise my voice, walk out if I need to walk out, to always be the bigger person. That's been the focus lately, because in the past that hasn't been my forte. I'm trying to, I think we need to undo a lot of the patriarchal stuff. I think that there is, I, w I want to raise a daughter who is, you know, feels like she doesn't have to emotionally caretake for her partner or her father or any of the men who are used to leaning on women for that. Because left to its own devices, this world will take girls there. Yeah. yeah. And, and allow the men to go to their narcissistic, the most extreme of which is our 45th president, Donald Trump. He is there as a shining beacon of what men should not become. And so we have the example of what the public considers strong in a man right. and what I consider to be weak in a man, which is an inability to look inward, an insecurity that affects behavior and you know, disrespect towards people, people unlike him. Yes, yeah. anyone unlike yes. him. It, it, there's not one exception. And I don't want to sit here and bash Trump. No. Obviously, we could, but... He is there as an example of what man and ego, unchecked, becomes sometimes. Absolutely. And I, I don't have any sympathy or empathy for him at all, but do you think... He's not self-aware enough to even realize... Sometimes I'm like, maybe this is all a front, and he's just like... He realizes how insecure he is, and, and, and it becomes an act, kind of like I think some of like the Fox News folks do that, where it just becomes... Or it becomes an act, and then it turns into a fake it till you make it, then you believe it yes, kind of situation? Yeah, I mean, I often wonder how can someone peddle lies? And it's not just Donald Trump saying the election was stolen. It's, uh, it's Bill Cosby saying that he never did any of those things. It's, it's Mark McGuire saying he never used steroids. steroids right. it's, it's all of those things where 
you are going to not be one with yourself. You are not transparent to the world. You are not feeling whole. But in, and yet you are living every day. And, and I don't get it. How can you sleep well in a situation like that? I, think, I mean, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> We're all different. But, I mean, there's shit that I did 30, 35 years ago that still sits on my conscience that I hate about myself. And, you know, 35 years ago, I was eight or how old am I? Now? I was ten. So I, I'm with you. Yeah. Do, do you know that it's it's impressive that that stuff just stays on your conscience? It's a good person. Have you tried going back to people in the forties yes. and being like, "Hey, that thing I did when I was ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, whatever Absolutely. it was." Absolutely. It feels good. It does feel good. Again, it gives you a little bit of closure. Um, people have done it to me, and I've done it to a lot of other people. And I probably should look look inward to think of who have I not uh, done it for that I need to. It's are important. You, are you good at apologizing? Are you good at making amends? I, I can own it. I actually find a lot of, like, I don't want to say pleasure, but I, it feels good to, to, yeah, to, you know, own your behavior, to, like, say I, I fucked up, whatever it is, whatever you have to say to have someone look at you and be like, huh, okay, I recognize that. That's pretty dope. Should we talk about it? I don't know. Have we, have we covered... The one thing we didn't talk about is that Bell Hooks book. We didn't talk about it. We talked a lot <laughs> about that Bell Hooks book during our highway conversation, but I think... The we, Will to Change. The Will to Change. I, I didn't choose to read it. It was left on my nightstand. By your wife? I mean, maybe, maybe... I can't imagine it was the kids. It just fell off the... Or the it, dog. It was just there. I should ask her if she put it there. If, she, if it was a plant. I, I mean... I just picked it up and started reading it. And it's a lot of what I didn't like about the academic... Like, the stuff I studied at Tufts under the sociology umbrella. Yes. It was just a lot of... The word patriarchal, institutional, systemic, whatever. But... It, Around that, she understands men in a way that is so deep. It's from her father, and she talks about a father void, which is where male rage comes from when they realize that their father is not available to them emotionally in significant ways. It turns into anger. She, and it, it was deep, and, and I think it's spot on. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I read the book about a year ago. And felt the same. And I dislike academic writing. I just find it devoid of... It's flavorless. It, it doesn't have... But this has enough personal nuance that it doesn't feel academic. Yeah, she's still alive. And uh, Bell Hooks is still alive. Well, maybe one time we can go see a reading of hers. Let's go see... We're going to go see Toad the Wet Sprocket. We're going to see Bell Hooks. What would be great is if Toad was playing a show and Bell Hooks was the opener. That would be really weird, and I don't know what that audience would look like. I, that's that's like, oh man, I can't even imagine. I think more bands should have as their openers, you know, critical uh, writers on culture and gender. We need to do. We need to figure like we do a festival, have like Guster, and then have like Michelle and Diggy Cello or somebody like that uh, play. Oh, she's awesome. I got she's to meet her. Fucking amazing. Yeah. First show I ever saw. Wow. Was her at Irving Plaza in 1993. Wow. So she said some very militant shit, and a bunch of white people left, and it was it was a great show. Yeah, you speak your truth. That's right. That's Care, right. Cares who leaks. That's right. I gotta say one thing before we wrap. Oh yeah, absolutely. The thing you said earlier about like me raging on Twitter and actually reaching people or a lot more people than you. That'll change. Well, it might. It might not. Oh, maybe, I mean, maybe we'll both end up. I, I don't feel like I reach a lot of people, but you will. Yeah, I mean, it's not. It's not. A, I mean, a. It's not a competition. But you're, you just put your voice out there. You keep what, doing what you're doing, getting people to open up on these levels, getting comedians to show you their darkness. Whatever it is that you're doing right now, being a, like a, a really great casual conversationalist. Thank you, Brian. That's working, and you're gonna put a lot of good stuff out there. Good content. Good content. It's, you know, I don't even think about it. 
in terms of content, I think about it. These are conversations I want to have. Like, this is shit I learn. Every time I talk to, whether it's you or anybody else that I've spoken to for this, I learn something. So it's, 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 I mean, sure, it's content, but for me, it's, it's like food for the soul, man. It's, it, 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 it's class. It's, it's, you know, yeah. So. I feel like we did better with this one than the one where we were sitting on the median of the of the road with the iPhone and the crabgrass that was stabbing me in the back. <laughs> you were so uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, I think I've recommended The Will to Change by Bell Hooks before, but if you have not read that book and you are a fan of this podcast, I very strongly suggest that you read it. It's a fantastic read. Uh, thank you, Brian, for recommending it. Thank you, Brian, for doing this not once, but twice. Glad we didn't have to deal with any traffic noises this time around. Brian Rosenworcel, of course, a member of Guster. You can find Guster on all applicable social media platforms at Guster. Uh, they'll have a new album coming out soon, I imagine, and uh, there'll probably be a tour behind that. So uh, stay up on their socials and find out when they will be coming to your town. I have seen them twice, and they are a great time. Uh, if you want to follow Brian's own ramblings on social media, <laughs> his quote-unquote angry ramblings, you can find him on Twitter at Bowl of Warsaw. That is Bowl underscore of underscore Warsaw, W-O-R-C-E-L. Brian, thank you once again for being on the show. Thanks again for listening to this episode. We really hope that you stick around and listen to future episodes or past episodes if you feel so inclined. You can obviously listen to Detoxicity on the podcast platform of your choosing. And if you want to get in touch with me, please hit me up on Instagram at DetoxPodGuy, Twitter, TizMikeJoseph, or you can email me at DetoxPod at gmail.com. Always willing to hear constructive criticism, thoughts, ideas, real realizations and if you yourself would like to be a guest on the show or you know somebody who would make a good guest i will take recommendations from now until the end of time so please feel free to reach out to me i want to thank a couple of people who've been very important to this show uh calvin williams composed the music that you hear at the beginning and end of every episode jacob block composed the logo or created the logo for the show and i want to give a special shout out to andrew grossman and jeff giles for providing inspiration for me to come up with this idea and bring it to fruition once again thank you all for listening i really really appreciate it and take care of yourselves peace <laughs>